I was sitting in the doctor's lounge a couple of months ago and there was a headline on a very popular news channel that said, BV is an STI. And I was like, what? BV is not a sexually transmitted infection. That's not what I was taught. But there was a new study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine recently. And the conclusion of the headlines was BV is an STI. Your partner needs to be treated. So today we're going to talk about that study because I had just finished a video on bacterial vaginosis. I went over some of the common causes, the symptoms, and the treatment for vaginosis. But in that video, I do not state that BV is a sexually transmitted infection, and most of us still don't believe that it is. But we're going to talk about the study, what it is, and what are some of their conclusions. So if that sounds good to you, continue watching. Well, welcome if you're new here. My name is Dr. DuPont. I'm a board-certified gynecologic oncologist, and I'm passionate about educating women on how to lead healthier and happier lives, and I believe that begins with great health. So if you haven't subscribed, please click the subscribe button below. Well, today we're going to talk about bacterial vaginosis and is it an STI? So what is bacterial vaginosis? So what I've always been taught is that it is really not a sexually transmitted infection, but it's an imbalance of the normal flora in the vagina. And so some of the symptoms are vaginal discharge that may be thin, may be gray, may have a fishy odor or like a smelly smell stinky smell <laughs> but it's usually like a fishy odor and it's a very common cause of vaginitis and patients see their doctors very often for it because it's very distressing for women and some women do get it more than once and some women have a hard time clearing the bacterial vaginosis infection so in vaginitis in women bv is due to 40 to 50 percent of all vaginitis yeast is due to 20 to 25 percent and then trichomonas is due to 15 to 20 percent there's some other non-infectious causes which are 5 to 10 percent of vaginitis those are usually due to atrophy which is the genital urinary syndrome of menopause so women that are postmenopausal who have kind of vaginal irritation or inflammation there's irritation due to maybe soaps or detergents or douching which you don't need to douche uh, the vagina is like a self-cleaning oven and allergic reactions of pet patients you know to use things on their skin that they have a really bad reaction to and so that can also cause the vaginitis or vaginal inflammation and in terms of diagnosing bacterial vaginosis, again, we'll get a clinical history, we'll do an exam. Typically, we'll do a pelvic exam where we actually look at the vagina, the cervix, make sure there's nothing like a foreign object or anything else causing the discharge. There are some many testing, you know, that we do detect bacterial vaginosis. Usually when we're doing a pap test, we can just add a few extra tests to that vial and send that off to the lab. There's some new DNA tests. Some of the basic common tests are just getting a microscope and do what's called AMSL test where we're looking for three or four of these diagnoses. So elevated pH over 4.5. Remember normal vaginal pH is 4.5. So if it's higher than 4.5, that's abnormal. We're looking for clue cells, which are vaginal epithelial cells covered with bacteria. You can look at that under a microscope and see those clue cells are very characteristic. And a positive whiff test. So that's where we add 10% potassium hydroxide to a vaginal sample and kind of smell it or we whiff it and that'll produce a strong odor and we say that's a positive whiff test. So if you have three of the four criteria, elevated pH, clue cells, whiff tests, and a vaginal discharge, three of those four, then we do say you have bacterial vaginosis. Treatment, very simple. We either give you an oral antibiotic or a vaginal antibiotic. Now in the U.S. we use metronidazole at 500 milligrams, one tablet twice a day if we're giving you the oral medicine. If we're giving you the vaginal preparation of metronidazole or flagyl, it's one applicator full in the vagina at bedtime for five nights. If we're using clindamycin cream or cleosin, it'll be one, it's a 2% cleosin and we'll put that in the vagina at bedtime for seven days. I do tell patients to avoid intercourse for a week while you're on the treatment and until your discharge is gone. There are some alternative treatments. We can do oral clindamycin. We can do clindamycin ovules, which is like a suppository in the vagina. There's Solisec, which is two granules. You'll put in like pudding or applesauce and you dissolve it in there and take the medicine. Tidinidazole is um, two grams orally daily for two days than the other medicine. Now we do know that the risk of recurrence is high. So 50% of patients will recur within three months. So that's one of the important factors with bacterial vaginosis is patients do have a hard time clearing the infection. And because it has an odor, it is very disconcerting to patients. And for 
Patients that have recurrent BV, that's defined as three episodes of BV in one year or two episodes of infection in six months. So that's how we define a recurrence. And the Center for Disease Control, the CDC in the U.S., recommends three months course of twice weekly metronidazole gel. So twice a week for three months in the vagina for patients that have recurrent infections is what the CDC recommends. I'll put a link to some of the CDC guidelines so that you can look them up if you have BV or if you want to talk to your doctor about kind of extended treatment because you keep getting infections. Well, this study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's from an Australian group. It was published in March of this year, 2025. And the, the title was Male Partner Treatment for to Prevent Recurrence of Bacterial Vaginosis. And so we're gonna talk about that study. How is it different from what we normally do in the US? And what are some of the important takeaways from this study? Well, this study studied 69 couples. Uh, they had a control group and a treatment group. So there were 69 couples in a treatment group, 68 couples in the control group. And in the control group, only the woman was treated. And that's kind of how we treat in the U.S. We only treat the female partner. The study, however, was stopped early after 150 couples were enrolled because of the findings that they found. Now, the study was actually powered to study 357 couples. So they didn't quite get all the patients that they had originally intended because the findings were so uh, convincing. Now the patients were mostly Caucasian and there were the study sites were two sexual health clinics in Australia, three family planning clinics, and again three states in Australia. 80% of the males were uncircumcised, which is kind of different than the U.S. population. And uh, there are a high percentage of women that had IUDs. So in the U.S., IUDs aren't as common, but 28% in the treatment group and 33% in the control group. So almost a third of the patients had an IUD. Now we do know an IUD is a foreign object, so we don't know, you know, does that affect the rates of BV or I don't know. But that's really important because that's kind of differs in, you know, my patient population that I see here in Houston. It was a small study and how they treated patients. So all women were treated. They were treated with metronidazole or flagyl, 400 milligrams twice a day for seven days. So again, in the U.S., we'll use 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. But in Australia, this is what they use. And then they use vaginal clindamycin for seven nights or vaginal metronidazole or flagyl um, for five nights. So Quintamycin is how we, we normally treat our patients and the vaginal flagell is how we treat the same dose of strength. Well, the study group, the partners were treated with oral metronidazole, 400 milligrams twice a day for seven days and topical cleomycin. So the men got oral and vaginal treatment. And so that was very interesting, whereas typically in the U.S. we don't treat men. So in the control group, the male partners were not treated and they weren't actually given a placebo also. But they were told to avoid relations for seven days. And so what this study found is that recurrence of BV after 12 weeks was 35% in the treatment group and 63% in the control group. So the treatment group actually had fewer recurrences. So remember, BV does recur a lot and most patients will recur. So this study showed that in the groups that the male and female partner were treated had a very low risk of recurrence, but still 35% is quite high. I would hope it, you know, I would thought it would be a lot lower, but still it is significant compared to the control group. So their conclusions, they did not conclude that BV was an STI, but they concluded the addition of combined oral and topical treatment of male partners to the treatment of women with BV resulted in a lower rate of recurrence of BV within 12 weeks when compared to the standard of care. So they themselves don't say that BV is an STI, but I found it funny that the media said, oh, BV is an STI, you have to be the male has to be treated in order for it to go away. Well, not quite true, but we do know in this particular study with women who may have been you know affected with BV or had a higher risk if we treated the men and the woman the risk of recurrence was lower it wasn't zero but it was much lower than the control group so the authors again did not say that BV was an STI and we do need more research before we start treating male partners but um, it's very interesting study and it does add a lot of good information it raises a lot of new questions that we need more research on to be able to find what's the best treatment for our patients so one thing that we do know, the Center for Disease Control does recommend, again, if you do have recurrent BV, that you should be treated for longer. So not just the seven days, you need to be treated extended. In the CDC states, women should really be treated up to three months, uh, twice weekly flagell, 
for patients with recurrent infections, but we do need more clinical trials. One thing that I did look up when I was doing my research on this is that there was a French study that looked at lactin V to prevent recurrence of bacterial vaginosis, and I found that very interesting. So in that study, what they shown is that patients who were treated with the metronidazole or flagyl, which is very commonly used to use used to treat BV, if they were treated and then followed for 11 weeks with an intravaginal lactin V, which is a lactobacillus um, crispitus, I hope I'm saying that right, patients had decreased risk of recurrence. So I looked at some of the over-the-counter medications that actually have this lactin V so that if you're interested and you are someone that gets BV often, you can actually purchase these. So one common one that's easily found in a drugstore is Azo Daily Probiotic. It does have the lactin V in it. So that's very um, useful because you can use that over the counter if you're someone that gets this infection. V Biotechs, and I'll put the link of these below so that you can re you can purchase them if you're interested. And there is a VS-01 vaginal symbiotic that does have this lactin V. So I did look at a lot of different medicines, and these are the three that I saw that specifically state on their ingredient list that they have the lactin V inside. And what I always tell patients is a healthy diet. I do like my patients to take a prebiotic and a probiotic. And I do tell patients to avoid fast food, to avoid eating out, because I have noticed in my patients who have a you know, diet rich in fruits and vegetables, they don't get recurrent bacterial vaginosis very often. But you know, there's something to consider that maybe if I have someone that's having bacterial vaginosis over and over, maybe treating the male partner is not a bad idea, but until we get more research and have more data, we won't, you know, we haven't started treating the male partner, but it's something to consider. It's a very great study. I will put a link of the study in the bio in the show notes below if you're interested. I hope that was helpful. Please check out my other video on bacterial vaginosis. I do go in depth into what BV is and how we treat it. I also did a video on yeast infections. So those are very common infections that that we see in the office. So if you're interested, please check out those videos. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching to the very, very end. And if you have not subscribed, please click the button below. And if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. It does help the algorithm push my videos to more people. And I do appreciate you watching to the very, very end. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.